Good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to be back. Where's the timer? I'm delighted to be back in Dublin. I thank Sharon and the team at um, Safe World Summit for having me back. And as I did two years ago, I will reintroduce myself to you. My name is Mona al and my declaration of faith is fuck the patriarchy. <laughs> Very soon after I spoke to you last time in 2016, I went home to Egypt, which is where I'm from. And I've been back and forth between Egypt and many countries uh, for several years now, but I moved back to Egypt in 2013 after the revolution to take part in feminist work on the ground and to dismantle this trifecta of misogyny that is the title of my talk. And the trifecta of misogyny is a phrase that I, I coined uh, very soon after our revolution in Egypt, when it became obvious that our revolution, as many revolutions, was not about gender, and it wasn't about dismantling patriarchy, it was about fighting the state. And I'm fine with fighting the state, I want to fight the state everywhere. But when I began to talk, and many other women began to talk about feminism, many of our comrades, our male comrades, would say, ah, Come on, we've got 60,000 political prisoners, people are being tortured, people are being disappeared, which are all terrible things. But in other words, wait. So half of society, if not more, are being told to wait. Wait until when? And they would tell me nobody is free in Egypt, and I know nobody is free in Egypt, but nobody is free in Egypt because the state oppresses everyone, but the state, the street, and the home together oppress women which is why no revolution will succeed unless we have a feminist revolution, because the feminist revolution will dismantle that trifecta of misogyny, which I believe is at the heart of patriarchy. But I'm actually here to talk about something that I believe will dismantle the patriarchy and that trifecta quicker, so I've re-updated the title of my talk to the seven necessary sins for women and girls. And I came up with this title earlier this year in February, because two major things happened for me and to me in February. The first was early in the month when I read a Facebook post by a Pakistani Muslim woman called Sabika Khan who shared her experience with being sexually assaulted in Islam's holiest site, Mecca, Saudi Arabia. I'm of Muslim descent. When I was 15 years old, when my family first moved to Saudi Arabia in 1992, we went on the pilgrimage, which is called the Hajj in Arabic. It was the first time in my life for me and my family to go to our holy sites, and we were performing the fifth pillar of our religion. And I was sexually assaulted twice, once by a policeman. I froze, I burst into tears, I had never been touched by anyone, let alone sexually assaulted, and I didn't know what to do. And freezing is a perfectly normal reaction, as many people in this room know. Fast forward to earlier this year, when I heard about Sabika's experience, and I heard that her Facebook post was being shared 2,000 times, if not more, within a few hours, but she was also getting a lot of shit for what she said. I had spoken out about what happened to me during Hajj several times before, so I decided to show solidarity again to Sabika, and also to honor black feminist activist Tarana Burke, who in 2006 began Me Too. Now, as many cases or many revolutions begin on the margins from people you don't often listen to or pay attention to. And what Tarana Burke did and what has happened since to Me Too is a perfect example. Because Tarana Burke has been working and saying Me Too since 2006, but it was when famous white women, famous in Hollywood, began to say it in 2017 that people paid attention. Just like Anita Hill in 1992 faced, or was it 1991, 27 years ago, exposed what Clarence Thomas did, and it took until Christine Blasey Ford, and I salute both of these women, but it doesn't take, I mean, it, it, you don't listen to black women, you don't listen to marginalized women, you listen to white women. And because of that, you can better understand how difficult it is for Muslim women to speak out, because we navigate a whole host of fuckery. On this side, I have racists and Islamophobes who want to demonize Muslim men and want to use my words against Muslim men. And on this side, I have the misogynists in my Muslim community who want to defend Muslim men and want to shut me and Sabika Khan up. And we're standing in the middle and I say, fuck you and fuck you. And so, 
I tweeted again, because I've spoken about it on TV in Arabic in Egypt, and the producer who invited me to speak about it in 2013 almost lost his job because no one had spoken about being sexually assaulted during Hajj before. So I spoke out again, and then I said, let's talk about this on the hashtag MosqueMeToo, because I knew that there was a church too. And this was a way of creating space for Muslim women to speak about it. I connected it to church too, so that no one says, oh my God, what is wrong with Muslim men? This is what is wrong with patriarchy. This is what is wrong with the power, the protection and the enabling of predators that patriarchy has allowed to happen worldwide, not just in the Muslim community, obviously. So of course, within hours, after I started this hashtag, which has since gone viral and has been used in languages across the world, I was told, you're too ugly to be sexually assaulted. You just want attention. You're trying to make Muslim men look bad. Why aren't you talking about sexual assault in New Zealand? How much did you get paid? On and on and on. So I would say, you know what? Okay, I'm ugly. I was still sexually assaulted. I want attention? Yes, I do, because I deserve it, because I have something important to say. This went on for days. And I heard from so many Muslim women who were sharing their own stories of what happened to them in the holy sites. And I just had all of this negative energy inside, so I decided to go dancing, because that's how I self-care. So my beloved and I went to a club. This was in Montreal, Canada. So in 19, 1982, I was sexually assaulted in Mecca. I was dressed from head covered, from head to toe. Only my hands and my face were showing in what is known as hijab. Fast forward to 2018, I go to a club in a tank top and my jeans and my boots. We're having a great time. And then I feel a hand on my ass. And I'm like, you've got to be fucking kidding me. I've spent the entire week writing about this and I've come here to self-care, an act of political resistance, as Audrey Lord says, and this piece of shit groped me. Now, I am a very angry person. <laughs> it's shocking, isn't it? <laughs> I have been for decades. I haven't just become angry after Donald Trump when white women realized, oh my God, what have we done? I have been angry for decades. Uh, but this moment was the most instinctual moment I have ever experienced. I turned around immediately and I knew who he was because everyone on the dance floor was dancing and this, someone, this was someone walking away. So I ran up to him, I grabbed his shirt from behind, and of course he had no idea what was coming because I'm 5'4", he's 6'2", who fights back in a crowded club? Very few people can. So I grabbed his shirt from behind, he was taken aback, there was a platform just in front of him, you know, where you get up and dance. He fell over the platform, I sat on him, and I began to punch. and I punched and I punched and every time I punched I was like don't you ever touch a woman like that again don't you ever and I punched about five or six times and then I wasn't done I was like uh -uh, I'm gonna continue punch 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 now from the side of my eye I could see that my beloved was standing there and two men jumped off the platform and tried to pull me off he said to them uh uh he assaulted her she's got this <laughs> and I did have it now, I have never beaten the fuck out of a man before, but I did that night. He stood up and he wanted to make eye contact with this woman who did this to him. He's like, who is this? He stands up, he adjusts his cap. He's got it on backwards, of course. <laughs> we make eye contact and I go smack across his jawbone. I almost broke my fingers. And then he ran away and it was fucking glorious. And then we go to the bar just so I can try to calm down. And one of the managers came up to me and asked what happened and I explained. And then he looked at my beloved and he looked at me and he goes, why didn't you let your husband take care of this? So I said, first of all, he's not my husband. Second of all, this is my body. He assaulted my body, I took care of it. And then we left the club and I began another hashtag five days later, hashtag I beat my assaulter. <laughs> and again, I heard from women all over the world, world sharing their stories. So it was a great bookmark, hashtag Moss Me Too, hashtag I Beat My Assaulter, because it was a reminder that in sacred space, we are assaulted. In secular space, we are assaulted. We are assaulted when we're wearing hijab. We are assaulted when we're wearing tank tops and jeans. We're assaulted fucking everywhere. <laughs> you 
Now, I am not saying go out there and beat everyone up because it is dangerous and I haven't always been able to beat my assaulter. But when you can do. <laughs> and I was so, I, I was like, by this stage, I had rage enough to fuel a rocket to Mars. Forget Elon Musk and his red sports car. I was gonna fuel it to Mars. So I decided to write a book called The, Nef the Seven Necessary Sins for Women and Girls. Because as Sharon so kindly introduced me, I've gone from fuck the patriarchy to make the patriarchy fear you. I want the patriarchy to look like that man that I beat up in the club that makes eye contact with you and says, who the fuck is this woman who doesn't fear me? Make patriarchy fear you. And these seven necessary sins are obviously inspired by the deadly sins, but fuck the deadly sins. I'm talking about necessary sins. And those necessary sins are, number one, anger, of course, because I've always been an angry woman. And as I told you when I was here two years ago, angry women are free women. And there's something that happens to girls, and they've actually studied this. There was a global adolescent survey that was released last year. They studied girls and boys across the world between the ages of four and 10, and they found that across the world, east, west, north, south, religious, atheist, by the age of 10, girls have understood and accepted that they're weak and vulnerable. So we have to keep that rage that girls are born with alive in them. We must not break it. We must tell girls what Ursula K. Le Guin told young women graduating in 1982 at a women's college in the US called Bryn Mawr, that you are volcanoes and I want to hear you erupt. So the first sin is anger. The second sin is attention because we're always called attention whores when we have the nerve to believe that we deserve to be listened to. And look at the word, the word that is used here, whore. We're damned if we do, damned if we don't. I was called an attention whore for creating Mosque Me Too, and I was asked, why didn't you make more of a fuss? And I was called an attention whore when I created I Beat My Assaulter, when I was told you made too much of a fuss. We're damned if we do and damned if we don't. So now I say, you know what? First of all, I have no problem with the word whore. I am a whore, I am a slut, done with those words. And yes, I do want attention because my ideas are important. I am important and I deserve attention. I'm done with humility. The third necessary sin is profanity because as you could tell, again, shocking, I love to swear. And swearing is important because we are socialized into being nice and polite. And as I always say, fuck nice and polite. What have nice and polite ever brought us? And I'm especially inspired by Ugandan feminist Stella Niazi, who was jailed last year for about 35 days and was subjected to a mental health test after she dared to call the dictator of that country, Yoweri Museveni, a pair of buttocks because he had reneged on a promise to end period poverty. And Stella Niazi says, I swear, and I am radically rude. She practices the concept of radical rudeness because she says our dictators, they have tanks, they have guns, they have grenades, and we have only our words. So she uses radical rudeness, and I love that idea. Because when we swear, it's like, whoa, language. And what are we swearing about? We're swearing about the crimes that patriarchy commits and our language is considered more violent than those crimes? Fuck no. So the third sin for me is profanity. The fourth sin is ambition. Because again, it's one of those dirty words for women, right? What is wrong with saying, I'm an expert in what I do. I am better than everybody else. I want to be better than everybody else. Why is that considered bad? So I want to talk about this idea that ambition, again, is something that is used as a dirty word for women. After that, I want to talk about power. And what does power mean for women? Because there is power that upholds the patriarchy and there is power that dismantles the patriarchy. And one thing that I wrote earlier this year that talks about the difference between those two is this newly appointed head of the CIA in the United States, Gina Haspel, a woman who has a horrendous record in terrorism and working on those so-called black sites. The Trump administration, we have, a, in case you missed it, we have a fascist fuck called Donald Trump, who's our president in, in the United States. 
He appointed Gina Haspel as some kind of feminist victory. And this is not a feminist victory. It is not a feminist victory for me that a woman can torture as well as a man can. So that is power that upholds patriarchy. I want power that dismantles patriarchy. And I want to talk about what that means for women. What is that power that we have been denied? We have to, as Sharon said in the introduction, defy, disobey, and disrupt patriarchy at every turn. Then I want to talk about violence and how and why I beat that man up. And you know, violence against occupation, against colonization, against imperialism has been discussed inside out myriads of times when it comes to fighting against a foreign force, fighting against an army that occupies you. Well, patriarchy is surely the ultimate form of occupation. It is, is it not legitimate to use violence to defend ourselves against that occupation? Is it not legitimate to use violence to liberate ourselves from that occupation? So I want to use that chapter to ask really uncomfortable questions. For example, and I will be putting a question mark at the end of this because I know this, people hate to talk about this. But what happens if, what would happen if a hundred women killed their rapist? What would happen if a thousand women killed their rapists? What would happen if some underground renegade rebel group every day killed 10 men and then the next month killed 50 men? This is a horrendous concept. Of course, I'm not encouraging murder. But what would happen if this underground group started doing that and patriarchy went, whoa, what's going on? We're like, oh, you want to talk now, huh? So what would happen if women started saying that we have the legitimate right to use violence against the ultimate occupation, which is patriarchy. And there is a great law journal article by a law professor called Mary Ann Franks at the University of Florida. She sent it to me after I beat that piece of shit up in the club about how society needs more legitimate forms of violence by women and it needs less illegitimate forms of violence by men. If you would like a copy of that article, I'd be happy to share it with you. The sin number seven is my favorite and it is lust. And the thing about lust is, again, it's one of those things because you're a whore, you're a slut, you're all of this. Sex is chaotic and six, and se six, six, sex, whatever you want to call it, sex is a form of liberation for me. Because as I told you last time I was here, it took me years to claim my own sexual liberation. And I'm glad I did. And for years I experienced guilt because of the various things that I was taught when I was growing up. And I got over that guilt by fucking it out of my system. <laughs> now, I was... Other than the sexual assaults in Mecca and the being groped in the club, like many people in this room, I have been groped and sexually assaulted in various places at various times. I often say if I were to use ink on my torso to mark the places where I have been sexually assaulted, groped, pinched, anything, without my consent, my entire torso, would, front and back, would be covered in paint. So we have to talk about consent and agency. We have to talk about ownership of our body. And I have to wrap up. And we have to say, I own my body. And saying, I own my body is the sexual revolution. And we have to talk about queerness as an act of resistance. Queerness as a revolutionary force. What the queer community, what who, we who identify as queer can use as a, as a revolutionary concept to muddle up what patriarchy tells us about who can have sex and how we can have sex and with whom. Because I say, I own my body, not the mosque, not the church, not the temple, not the state, not my family, not the home, not the street. And I have the right to have sex with whomever, with their consent, obviously, whenever. With a man, with a woman, with five women, with five men. So that's about lust. So that will be the book that I'm going to pour my rage into and which hopefully, fingers crossed, is coming out autumn 2019, because I am fed up with all these peace treaties with patriarchy and the roadmap to peace with, pa I'm done. This is gonna be a Molotov cocktail to throw at patriarchy. <laughs> and I want to leave you with, posi with positive words. I mean, there is a space for negative words, obviously, but these are words that fuel my rage. And I love poetry because poetry is revolutionary and poetry gets to places that other forms of writing don't often get to. 
And there are two poets who have been particularly helpful and inspirational for me. One is the bisexual poet Muro Rukaiza, who asked in one of her poems, what would happen if a woman told the truth about her life? The world would split open. So I want you to go out there and split the world open. And last but certainly not least, the black lesbian poet and activist June Jordan, who's an incredible hero of mine, and I have her words tattooed on my skin. And she wrote in a poem to South African women who were fighting all their revolutions under apartheid at the time and continue to fight now. She wrote, we are the ones we have been waiting for. You are the ones you have been waiting for. Go out there and look patri patriarchy in the eye. Go out there, tell patriarchy, fuck you. Go out there and make the patriarchy fear you. Thank you.